first learned about the Jewish tradition of two messiahs in the late 70s or early 80s. I can't remember exactly when, but of course, there were no personal computers in those days, no cell phones, no internet. Uh, if we learned something new back then, it was usually at a fireside chat on Sunday evenings, uh, something that uh, then was uh, followed up with hours of research at the University of Library. University Library. I remember doing that many times. However, today you can find a Wikipedia article on the two messiahs and learn almost all there is to know about it in just a few minutes. We've talked about it in past episodes, and Al and I had even discussed it a couple of years ago when someone was going to be speaking on it at a fireside scheduled in his area. But just as the uh, prophecy of Rabbi Yitzhak Itzhak Kaduri, I think is the way his name is pronounced, um, just as his prophecy that the name of Messiah would be Jesus was suppressed by the media, and that's what has brought it up, and we've talked about this, uh, the Jewish people cannot brook the idea. So uh, the long tradition of Jews that a forerunner of Messiah bin David would come first uh, has also been suppressed by the Christian world in like manner. Uh, known as Messiah ben Joseph, he is to play a big part in the restoration of the house of Israel before the coming of the Savior, King Jesus, to rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years. In past episodes of Voices from the Dust Radio, we have learned how the rabbis speak of this descendant of Joseph as one who is killed but who is resurrected to gather the children of Israel, march to Jerusalem, take it back from the enemy, and establish a government and temple worship in the city. In preparation for the coming of Messiah, Ben David clothed in the brightness of his glory. Well, of course, this is not something that is readily accepted by the Christian world, especially by those who are familiar with Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Restoration, who was killed by a mob of Christians for his testimony that he was sent of God and ordained to head up the dispensation of the fullness and t- fullness of times in which all things are to be restored, as Peter the, the apostle taught uh, the early saints in book uh, in the book of Acts chapter three, when he said that uh, Jesus uh, didn't come until the rest or, uh, restitution of all things. Now uh, we find this modern rabbi saying essentially the same thing, but with a really odd twist to it, which we'll get to here. But the prospect that Joseph Smith might be resurrected by the Lord to fulfill this mission of Messiah ben Joseph, who is sent to redeem Zion, uh, but now with respect to the New Jerusalem, the holy city that is to be built in America, as prophesied in modern revelation and referred to in the record of the voices from the dust, is clearly something that is not widely discussed today, even among Mormons, let alone non-Mormons. But I think it's clearly the case that Joseph Smith is that Messiah ben Joseph that the rabbis speak about. To be sure, the rabbis have no idea Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet, is the descendant of Joseph of old, as they are unlikely to be acquainted with the Holy Scriptures that were restored through the prophet and which contain the prophecy of the choice seer that was to come through the fruit of his loins, that is, the fruit of the loins of Joseph of old, and be an instrument in the hands of the Lord in restoring Israel to a knowledge of their God in the latter days, a knowledge which was had by their fathers, which now speak to them from their graves by means of their writings, which the Lord preserved and brought forth, and uh, and translated into all the languages of the world by the gift and power of God. Well, evidently, this 108-year-old Rabbi Kaduri may have known something about this great mystery. Carl Gallup's, uh, the author of the book, certainly learned about it in his investigation of the controversy surrounding the Rabbi's revelation to the world that the name of the of uh, the Messiah is actually Jesus. Uh, That's why I was so looking forward to his appearance on the Coast to Coast AM show with uh, George Norrie. He was to appear, I think, uh, not Sunday, Monday, 
uh, or I don't remember the exact date. I had to listen to it belatedly uh, as when it appeared on uh, on uh, on YouTube. But it was not uh, too long ago. It was recently when he appeared to discuss his new book and the documentary that accompanies it called "The Rabbi Who Found Messiah." And uh, that's being promoted pretty heavily now by uh, uh, World Net Daily uh, that had encouraged uh, Gallops to write the book when they found out about the uh, rabbi and his revelation. And so I was really anticipating the discussion of the two messiahs on that program with its huge audience thinking that it would finally let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, and force the discussion of Messiah ben Joseph as well as Messiah ben David and how the two go together and get it out in the open. But alas, as I belatedly listened to the program on YouTube last night, I did not even hear the topic mentioned. And to say the least, I was very disappointed because... It's so exciting to hear this Southern Baptist preacher. I think it's he's a Baptist preacher. It may not be Southern Baptist. I'm not sure. But uh, he is a well-known radio preacher down south. And uh, he talks to her about the two messiahs in a way I've never heard any uh, discussion, uh, public discussion before. And so it's pretty exciting. Even though, of course, he makes no connection to Joseph Smith. He really makes it clear, though, how big a deal it is to the Jews. And uh, that's something that I think we need uh, to understand. Well, I was hoping he would have time to explain how another well-known radio preacher in the South called Pastor Dan uh, was just delighted that his rather well-documented book came out because of the controversy over the rabbi's revelation, which had developed on on uh, Pastor Dan's show between a Jewish rabbi friend of his and Chris Putnam, a popular Christian scholar uh, who has uh, been on Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie lately uh, several times and uh, to discuss his book uh, along with um, his partner. uh, I can't think of his his name right off. It's just skipped me, but they've written uh, about the popes and they became... Uh, really, really uh, famous overnight when they predicted the retirement of, uh, of, of Pope Benedict, and uh, and uh, so that was was amazing because that nothing like that had ever happened in 600 years, over 600 years, and yet they were able to predict that it was going to happen. So um, Chris Putnam, along with uh, uh, oh, geez, name's on the tip of my tongue. Uh, but anyway, uh, those two have been on Coast to Coast to discuss their book. And so this would have been great because it would have, there's a huge audience uh, uh, to with Coast to Coast AM, and they were familiar with, with of course, uh, uh, Chris Putnam. And uh, so this would have been a, uh, a great segue into the discussion of the two messiahs, but it didn't happen. But the good news is that I've managed to get some clips from Pastor Dan's show that I could play for for us now, and uh, so we can get a flavor of the drama uh, that was going on. I was hoping it would be uh, uh, put on uh, coast to coast, but uh, wasn't. But at least we can, in our little audience here of a few dozen maybe, <laughs> we can get a, an idea of this. So the first clip kind of introduces the discussion. Pastor Dan says that he came across this hidden knowledge. It's not, you know, he hadn't known anything about it before. Of course, many of them don't. Uh, so, you know, we could say it's sort of the hidden knowledge uh, that uh, he asks people uh he he thinks it's so important that he asked people to get a copy of of Gallup's book, and uh, and and not only read it but take it before the Lord and pray about it. And of course, you know we're thinking of the Book of Mormon all the time how they should get that and read it and, and pray about it. But uh, now we're going to go to this first clip to get things started here. Well, you know, 
I really feel um, that you, after reading, the, you know, I got kind of taken into this whole thing by accident, like I said, with, you know, having the guest on and the other one and then um, start, then finding out that you wrote the book, which was the, is the blessing, so to speak, at the end of that. But, um, you know, I really believe, folks, that this book, you, you, I mean, it will open up if you open your heart and you pray about it before you go into it, like you do with your Bible. I believe there's some things that are going to be revealed to you, and you're going to get a greater understanding of, number one, of why the Jews even thought the way that they did and in a way that they do, because of this thing called, uh, that you point out so greatly. And I hadn't heard anybody else talk about it. It was told to me by a rabbi I had on a couple of years ago, and talked Talk about hatred. When I first asked him to come on, Carl, he sent me to a website that told me what they thought about the Christians, and it was just really horrible. And I said, well, let's move on beyond that. I still want you on. And we talked, and he told me about the two messiahs. And that's a really amazing fact that most Christians know nothing about. See, the amazing fact that most Christians, in fact, I'd say 99% of them know nothing about. And... uh, so, so it's really important. I, I'm so uh, pleased with this. I was just, again, disappointed that it didn't get it out on coast to coast. Okay, but this is, uh, um, even this much is great because it shows how different the understanding of the coming of the Messiah is for the Jews and the Christians. See, the Jews expect this uh, restoration to the lands of their inheritance. The prophets all talk about it. If you read Ezekiel 36, Jeremiah, all, just all of them, especially Isaiah uh, in the Old Testament. See, that's the idea that that uh, the Lord is going to remember his people. He's going to take the suffering from their hands and put it into the hands of, of their enemies. Those who said, lay your body down, and they had to lay their body down while they walked over. Oh, man, it's moving. The pathos is just thick, and especially in Isaiah that approaches poetry but uh, even in uh, Ezekiel where he talks about how the land he actually talks to the land and tells it how it will uh, be no longer consuming its inhabitants uh, you know referring to the judgments of God but when the righteous uh, when its uh, rightful owners uh, are returned to it then it shall bring forth its bounty and, and he goes into such detail it's really amazing uh, but uh, so the fact that the idea of the Messiah bin Joseph uh, it, 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 it leads this off is so strong among the Jews um, that this restoration to their lands of inheritance comes before the coming of Messiah bin David and that many of them see the fulfillment of these things uh, in the sad case of the former Prime Minister of Israel, Ariel Sharon, is uh, something we're going to see here uh, eventually, and in, in, uh, but then we'll compare that to, to uh, Joseph Smith uh, as we see Joseph Smith fulfilling that um, that uh, prophecy and uh, being actually the Messiah Ben Joseph. But let's go to clip two now. I want to hear more about this. Bring us into these two messiahs. What am I talking about? Two messiahs. Yes. I thought there was yes. one. Yes, well, well, this will certainly help. Uh, this, this. Let me let me explain this, and this will bring the New Testament alive to your listeners. The the, the Jews for for the longest, and I don't know really where this originated. It goes back thousands of years, and there are various denominations of of belief as to how all of this fits together. But generally speaking, among the Orthodox Jews, they believe that there will be two messiahs that will come to Israel. They call the first one, Messiah ben Joseph. And as you know, the word ben is Hebrew, means son of. Messiah, son of Joseph. And then they believe that the ultimate Messiah, who will rule and reign and restore Israel to, as the rightful leader of nations among nations, is Messiah ben David, Messiah, son of David. Now, this is so fascinating because what they say now the bible doesn't say these things specifically but the jewish teaching the jewish commentary upon the bible the jewish tradition the jewish oral teachings the the rabbinical jewish teachings teach that messiah ben joseph when he comes he will be more of a government 
hostile political military uh, type figure who will lead the nation to become a strong nation to prepare the way for Messiah ben David, the ultimate ruler. But Messiah ben Joseph will be, quote, rejected by his brothers. He will be eventually killed, but he will be eventually resurrected when Messiah ben David comes. Messiah ben David will affect his resurrection from the dead. Well, that's astounding. And then they teach that when Messiah ben David comes, that he will rule and reign and bring Israel into the forefront among the nations, and the messianic reign of God will be upon the face of the earth in Messiah ben David. Now, this is now for our Orthodox Jewish listeners. Please hear me. I, I'm not trying to do a travesty to that teaching. I I know it's much more complex than that. And there are various flavors of that teaching among the Jews, so I, I understand that. I'm just trying to simplify it for the sake of our discussion tonight. But those are the two messiahs. Now, Pastor Dan, of course, as I'm saying this, you're, you're, you're chomping at the bits because you understand that <laughs> Jesus, Yeshua, Yehoshua, he fulfilled both Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David expectations of the Jews. As a matter of fact, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of the donkey and in the week of Passover, right before his crucifixion, the people were hailing him as Hosanna to the son of David. And that's why the Pharisees went to him and said, tell your disciples to stop this. This is blasphemy because the people were hailing Jesus as Messiah ben David, the ultimate Messiah. See, Modern Christians, especially those that live in America 2,000 years later, we read that passage and we don't understand the power of it. When they were calling him uh, Jesus, the son of David, we think, oh, well, they didn't really know he was Messiah. Look, they're calling him son of David. No, that's the Jewish term for the ultimate Messiah, the one who would come and rule and reign. And, and think of this, Pastor Dan. This understanding of the two messiahs also explains why Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus. Because Judas thought that Jesus, who was also son of Joseph, right? Mary, his mother, Joseph, his earthly father, this right. messiah ben Joseph, he thought that Jesus was going to come and rule and reign as this militaristic, governmental, political figure who could raise the dead, who could heal the sick, who could create food out of a couple loaves of bread and some fish. I mean, what a military he could have if he could heal the soldiers that got wounded, if he could feed the soldiers with a few loaves of bread and fish. I mean, here is Messiah ben Joseph. And that also explains why James and John, their mother went to Jesus and said, look, when you come into your kingdom, I want my boys, one to sit on your left and one to sit on your right. She wasn't talking about a millennial reign or, or a heavenly kingdom. She thought he was Messiah ben Joseph, and, and so did some of the disciples early on. They, they were ready to get on with it. They were ready to get on with the political ruling and reigning to make way for Messiah ben David. So that's pretty fascinating stuff, isn't it, Brother, brother Dan? Well, uh, I would disagree with Gallup in this uh, a great deal because – there were many who realized that he was uh, that Jesus was claiming to be uh, Messiah Ben David, that he was the son of David. Remember the publican up in the tree. Uh, all, there's lots of instances there. Uh, I think it's a stretch to think that any of them thought that he was uh, Messiah Ben Joseph, because even though. Mary's husband's was husband was named Joseph. He was not a descendant of the of, the, of Joseph of old. The, that Messiah they understood, the, at least the rabbis uh, understand today. Even that uh, that Messiah um, spoken of is a descendant of Joseph of old. He's from the northern kingdom, which had long since been. Uh, destroyed and uh, people taken captive at the time of of Jesus. So, um, but again, it was confusing for people who were trying to understand this. Uh, the Carl Gallup might have mentioned out of the New Testament, speaking of making it come to alive, the fact that when the disciples 
uh, were coming down from the mountain with Jesus after they had seen, and well, they didn't see, but they heard so much. They saw a lot too, but they didn't see uh, everything. But uh, anyway, they then understood very clearly that uh, Jesus was Messiah Ben David because the Father had declared him, say, you know, uh, this is my son, hear him up on the mountain. So when they're coming down, they said, well, you know, here, here you are, obviously the Messiah, all right, but the scribes have always taught that uh, Elias would come first and restore all things. And uh, then, of course, uh, Jesus said, well, uh, that's right. They are correct. But I say unto you that Elias has come already, and they did whatsoever they, they wanted uh, to him. And then that's when they understood that he talked to them, uh, or that he was referring to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist did come, remember, as the preparation before the first coming of the Messiah, but uh, what the scribes were teaching and what uh, the uh, um, disciples wanted to understand more clearly was the fact that uh, there would be a forerunner in the spirit of Elias that would come before uh, the Messiah Ben David. Well, anyway, we're going to run out of time. I've got one more clip to play here, and that's uh, to show how... The Jews that believe in this so much have uh, uh, decided, many of them, that Errol Sharon might fulfill this role. Let's let's play that next clip. Um, then Errol Sharon figures into the to the the two Messiah thing, and that's pretty fascinating in itself too. Yes, it is because you see when we hear. Rabbi Kaduri saying, "Well, he has to die first before Messiah Ben David comes." Well, immediately the Western mind thinks, well, he's just upset with uh, 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 Sharon and, 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 and thinks he has to die. But from the Jewish mindset, it's highly possible, and I can't prove this because I, I don't know what Kaduri was thinking, but since I know he was a rabbinical Jew and, 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 and a venerated rabbi, more than likely he was thinking that perhaps Ariel Sharon was Messiah ben Joseph. Now, now a lot of people in Israel think that. In fact, you can get on the Internet and find Orthodox Jews who say that they believe that, that Ariel Sharon was Messiah ben Joseph. Okay, why? Well, Ariel Sharon was in Israel's military as a young uh, officer before Israel was even a nation. In other words, there was a, there was a kind of an underground uh, revolutionary military that was being put together uh, before the 1948, May 1948 uh, Independence Day, and Ariel Sharon was a part of it. So he was a part of the birthing of Israel, and when you look at his history, and my book points this out, he was rejected by his brothers. And but yet, I mean, they 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 teased him. He was fat. He was um he was a little arrogant. Uh, he was overbearing. Uh, they teased him unmercifully. His his own it's kind of the Joseph story in the coat of many colors. He was rejected by his own people, by his brothers. Yet he rose to be this military military hero in Israel. Eventually rose into all manner of governmental offices until he finally was prime minister. He is the one who led Israel in the Yom Kippur War, the Six-Day War, the recapturing of, of Jerusalem, the recapturing of Sinai. He, he was in the War of Independence. He was eventually tagged with the name uh, Ariel Sharon, uh, Lion of Israel, King of Israel. Some even called him the Savior of Israel. So you see all of these messianic terms, and by the way, all of this is documented and resourced in my book. I mean, this comes, oh, yeah. right, out of, it comes right out of the Israeli newspapers. I mean, this is not stuff I'm making up. And, and so you've got all of these, and then what happens to him? Well, he's rejected by his brothers, yet he rises to become this political military hero, the savior of Israel, and then he, quote, dies, but not really. He's just hanging in there in a coma for how many years? Not six, not eight, but seven, <laughs> a yeah. number of perfection, seven years. 
he's in a coma. If he wakes up, people will claim that he has resurrected, and here's Messiah ben Joseph. And when he dies, though, then Messiah ben David can come. So, so do you see how the Jewish mindset uh, uh, thinks about these things? See, and that's uh, so important. We don't have that much time left, about three minutes. But I wanted to point out so, oh, so much, and you need to go back if you're interested in these things and read uh, or listen to our past episodes. But we show how, you know, Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Restoration, uh, is the Lord's servant, and his people, of course, uh, are identified with Ephraim and uh, Joseph uh the father of Ephraim, uh, who is to be the head of this, the dispensation of things. See, that plays into this as well. So what we see is the the Lord speaking in the Book of Mormon, saying that you know all this would be declared to the Gentiles. The fullness of the gospel would be declared to the Gentiles, which of course fullness includes the restoration of the house of Israel and, to their lands and the favor of the Lord, the blessings of the Lord that are so tremendously uh, described by the ancient prophets and which are quoted, especially Isaiah, quoted by the Savior himself uh, that uh, is so moving. But uh, but it says that uh, there will be many that will not believe, uh, though a man declare it unto them, and yet it talks about his servant uh, being marred uh, because of that unbelief, uh, yet he says, uh, life of my servant will be in my hands and I will heal him and show unto the children of men that my wisdom is greater than the cunning of the devil. And so we see that that refers to section 101 as we've discussed and the hedge being broken down and the, and the 12 trees being broken down and the servants of the Lord fleeing and then the Lord coming and saying, what's the cause of this? And, they, and, of course, that's because the tower wasn't built. But then he says that he sends one of his servants, which later is identified as Joseph Smith, to uh, go and uh, gather the strength of his house, his warriors, and come and redeem his uh, vineyard for it is his. He's paid for it with money, which, of course, refers to New Jerusalem. And then the city will be built, the holy city, and the power of God be among its inhabitants and Jesus himself be in their midst as they prepare for his second coming. It is so fantastic, and we haven't even talking about, talked about Micah and the idea of be, the breaking out of the sheepfold of Basra and who Basra is and so on. But we did that in our previous episodes, and next time I'll, I'll get a link to that. All right. Well, I uh, hope everyone has a wonderful day today. And as always, I pray that the Lord's choicest blessings be with you all as we study the Word of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.